Mayor, 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 members of the Walter Roberts Endowment Board, friends and colleagues, good evening and welcome to the 11th Annual Walter R. Roberts Lecture. I'm Janet Steele, the Director of the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication. Uh, tonight, IPDGC, the Walter Roberts Endowment, and our co-sponsor, the Seeger Center for Asian Studies, are very pleased to welcome Ambassador Ted Osius, the former U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam. Ambassador Osius will be speaking on the topic of his new book, Nothing is Impossible, America's Reconciliation with Vietnam, the story of the two countries' 25-year journey from adversaries to friends and partners. As U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam, Ted Osius and his husband, Clayton Bond, were actively engaged in public diplomacy, participating in a series of carefully planned, thoughtfully executed engagements with the Vietnamese people. These included everything from releasing a bucket full of fat carp into Hanoi's West Lake during Tet, to, to in Tet's case, bicycling up and down the entire country from north to south. Called the People's Ambassador by the Vietnamese press, Ted and his husband Clayton demonstrated that American families can be what he described as multi-hued with two dads, while at the same time being both traditional and modern. It's thus highly fitting that Ambassador Osius be the speaker at an annual lecture series that honors the memory of Dr. Walter R. Roberts. Throughout his 42-year career, Dr. Roberts was dedicated to the advancement of public diplomacy through the creation of Voice of America, diplomatic assignments in Europe, presidential appointments to the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy, and 10 years of teaching at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs. Dr. Roberts understood the critical importance of education and training, and his contributions to the study and practice of public diplomacy and global communication has significant, have significantly enhanced GW's leadership in this important area of learning. Since 2011, the Walter R. Roberts Endowment, which was created by the Roberts family and, uh, and housed at the George Washington University, has hosted annual lectures with prominent foreign policy figures. We're lucky to have Patricia Roberts with us in person tonight and Ambassador Bill Roberts attending via Zoom. In the book that Ambassador Osius is going to discuss tonight, which incidentally is available for sale after the program, he cites several times a Vietnamese proverb that says, when you go on a journey, you come back with wisdom. Tonight, Ted is going to share with us some of the wisdom he acquired during his 28 years in the Foreign Service, or maybe 30 years, 30 years. <laughs> I've realized that number may be wrong. Uh, sorry about that. Dr. Alyssa Ayers, the Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs, will be introducing our speaker. A scholar as well as a practitioner, Dean Ayers has had a distinguished career in government, nonprofits, and the private sector. Among her numerous accomplishments, she served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia between 2010 and 2013, and we are most grateful to her for agreeing to introduce Ambassador Osius tonight. A few quick notes. Tonight's program will begin with Ambassador Osius' lecture, which will be followed by a moderated discussion with me. Uh, we, will then, we will end with questions from both of our audiences, in person and virtual. If, you have, if you're in the virtual audience and have questions, please do submit them via the question function rather than chat, because I'm going to be the MC up here and it's very hard to look at both of them at once. So again, thank you so much for joining us and please enjoy the program. Dean Ayers, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Professor Steele, for that introduction. I'll take my mask off as I'm a little bit far away from everyone's chairs. Thank you for that introduction and for your stewardship of the Global Communications Program in the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication. This annual event and the many illustrious speakers we have hosted at the Elliott School for this Walter Roberts Lecture over the years showcases the Institute's breadth of engagement on the subject of public diplomacy. We are just one of a handful of institutes across the United States with this focus. Now, I could not be happier to have the honor of welcoming Ambassador Ted Osius to the Elliott School as our Walter Roberts Lecturer this year. I'm happy because Ambassador Osius has a distinguished career diplomat's perspective on the many aspects of diplomacy that help accomplish foreign policy successes, including public diplomacy through education, through extensive public engagement, through exchange, through commercial engagement, through bicycle diplomacy, and many other dimensions. So he'll share some of his expertise on that front with us tonight as he discusses his new book, Nothing is Impossible, America's Reconciliation with Vietnam, a reconciliation in which Ambassador Osius played key roles at different periods, from opening the U.S. consulate in Ho Chi Minh City and his service at the U.S. Embassy in Hanoi during the mid to late 90s, to his return to Vietnam as the U.S. Ambassador in 2014. His insights on diplomacy and the arc of reconciliation will be important for us all to absorb. 
But on a personal note, I'm also very happy to welcome Ambassador Osius here tonight because he is a friend and former colleague, and I know firsthand what a diplomatic talent he is. We first met in 2007 when I served at the State Department on the staff of former Under Secretary of State Nicholas Burns, who at the time was Chief Negotiator of the U.S.-India Civil Nuclear Agreement. And at that time, Ambassador Osius was the head of our political team in India, a position known as Minister Counselor for Political Affairs. And I could always rely on his good judgment as we slowly inched forward in that negotiation, ultimately to success. His decades of service in the U.S. Foreign Service began in 1989, and through his many overseas assignments in the Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, India, Indonesia, where he served as Deputy Chief of Mission, or the number two person at the embassy, and then his Washington assignments in the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs, he became one of our country's leading experts on Asia, with expertise across South, Southeast, and East Asia. He would build on this expertise during a year's assignment at a think tank, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, during which he authored a major report on economic integration between India and ASEAN. He then built on this foundation, serving as an associate professor at the National War College. I met one of Ambassador Osius's classes during his time at the War College, and they asked very thoughtful questions, which tells you that he was a very thoughtful professor. In 2014, President Barack Obama nominated Ambassador Osius to serve as U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam, where he served until 2017. In Vietnam, he led a mission of about 900 members of staff and implemented strategies to deepen security ties, signed billions of dollars worth of commercial deals, expanded educational exchanges, and concluded agreements on trade, law enforcement, and environmental protection. He was the first U.S. Ambassador to receive the Order of Friendship from the President of Vietnam. Let me tell you a few other things about Ambassador Osius and his leadership. He was a founding member of the affinity group Gays and Lesbians in Foreign Affairs Agencies, or GLIFA, at a time when U.S. security clearance procedures could threaten the careers of LGBT employees. GLIFA has played an important advocacy role as the official voice of LGBT members of the U.S. Foreign Affairs Agencies. When he went to Vietnam in 2014 to lead the U.S. mission there, Ambassador Osius became the first openly gay U.S. ambassador to serve in East Asia. He married his partner, Clayton Allen Bond, also a former Foreign Service officer in 2006, and together they have a six-year-old daughter and seven-year-old son. Ambassador Osius resigned from the Foreign Service in 2017 over the policy direction of the Trump administration. He wrote about this difficult decision in the Foreign Service Journal, and I urge you all to read his essay. He felt he could not, in good conscience, implement the policies he was asked to implement. He concluded that he could better serve his country from outside of government. And his post-Foreign Service career took him to higher education as the first vice president of Fulbright University, Vietnam, then to the tech industry as vice president for government affairs and public policy of Google Asia Pacific, and just two months ago, in August 2021, he was named the new President and Chief Executive Officer of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council. His book, Nothing is Impossible, America's Reconciliation with Vietnam, which he will discuss tonight, was published this month, and it covers the two countries' 25-year journey from adversaries to friends and partners. It has already received accolades, including from former Vice President Al Gore, from former Secretaries of State Madeleine Albright and John Kerry, from U.S. members of Congress, such as Senator Patrick Leahy and Congressman Tom Malinowski, and from former Harvard President Drew Gilpin Faust, among others. So accolades from such a range of expert readers is rare indeed. So we are in for a treat tonight. Will you all please join me in welcoming Ambassador Odious, Osius to the podium. Too close. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Um, it's uh, truly an honor to be able to deliver uh, the Walter Roberts lecture, and I am I'm very moved uh, uh, to be introduced by such good friends. So, uh, Alyssa, uh, Dean Ayers uh, mentioned that we've known each other for a long time since since she and Nick Burns brought about a transformation in U.S.-India relations, uh, getting beyond the past and creating a, a new and very positive future for the United States and India. And 
I've been learning from Professor Steele for a long time about Indonesia, where we also, by coincidence, uh, I think got beyond a very difficult past and were able to create a new positive comprehensive partnership between the United States and Indonesia. So I think this school is really well served and really, really grateful to be able to, to speak with you tonight. Also, they are both very prolific writers. And having just finished this book, I know that if you, you to really, to complete a book, you have to be compelled. You have to, it has to be in you burning to get out because that's the only way to get through the, the agonies of writing a book. Um, but I'm, and I've uh, read both of their writing and am a great, great, great admirer. Uh, my book is not really a policy book. It's a, it's a book of stories uh, because I've, I've concluded that, uh, that reconciliation is about people. So the, the book is, a, is stories of people, people who I think were very brave on the, on the American side and on the Vietnamese side in bringing about reconciliation, taking two uh, former enemies and making them into friends and partners. Um, and so I'm gonna speak with you about the book in two parts tonight. Um, part one, I'll call building trust. And part two, I'll call taking risks. And so I'm gonna start with a story. And just by coincidence, um, uh, I, just, I learned that today, is the 54th, today is the 54th anniversary to the day of uh, when, when John McCain was shot down over Chukbok Lake in Hanoi. And let me describe a little bit about what that was like. Um, he, was, uh, he, was, he had been flying uh, bombing runs over the city of Hanoi. And when his plane was shot down, he was ejected very forcibly from the cockpit so forcibly that by the time he was in the air, he had broken two arms and a leg. Uh, and then he hit the water really hard. And then the people who came out to pull him ashore were not so much interested in the well-being of John McCain. They were pretty mad uh, because of what he'd been doing to their city, to their families. So they dragged him ashore and someone stuck a bayonet in his groin. Um, and by then his bones from his leg were protruding through the skin. And they uh, hauled him off to uh, what the French called uh, Hua Lo Prison. The Vietnamese called the Hua Lo Prison. The, the French called the Fiery Furnace. And it was a really unpleasant place. Uh, the Americans referred to it as the Hanoi Hilton, uh, but it was, it was no Hilton. Um, the stories I have heard in the years, make, uh, years since make one's blood curdle. And, the, and uh, certainly... Uh, Senator, uh, later Senator McCain at that time, uh, uh, co uh, Commander McCain, Captain McCain, um, was not treated well. And by, I think, June of the following year, they had, the warden had figured out who he was. He was the son of Admiral McCain. He was the grandson of another Admiral McCain. So they had figured out he was actually a very valuable prisoner. By then, he had shrunk down to about 98 pounds, and he'd been kept alive by his fellow prisoners. His bones had been set without any anesthetic. He had never received any treatment for his, his wounds, uh, and he was in really bad shape. And uh, the warden said, McCain, you can go free. You can get on the next plane. You can be out of here. You, you can go free. And he said, let me get back to you on that. And he went back and talked to uh, the cellmate, the person who was right next in the cell right next to his, Bob Craner. And he said, you know, there is this military code. First in, first out. If you were the first prisoner of war to go in, you should be the first one to go out. Well, I, I'm not the first one in, so I can't go out according to the, to the military code. And Craner said to him, John, you are going to die. If you stay, <laughs> there's no chance. And so you're exempt. You don't have to follow the code. Someone who's this badly hurt doesn't have to follow the military code. You, 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 you can go. And uh, McCain thought more about it. And he didn't go. And I tell you this story because uh, flash forward 
a quite a few years to when I went to his Senate office and I sought his support for my confirmation as the sixth US ambassador to Vietnam. And he took me by the arm. And he took me over to a little uh, uh, framed telegram on his wall. And there was one line under, uh, underscored and it said the warden at uh, the warden in the Hanoi prison offered freedom to Senator to Admiral McCain's son, and he said no. He turned down the offer. And at the time, I wondered why is he why is he showing me this? Uh, why is he showing me this cable? And only gradually did I realize he was telling me who he was as a human being. He was telling me about the the single most important decision of his life. I think it's the one that uh, made him who he was going forward. That decision to choose honor country, the code over his own life, because he certainly was not expected uh, to make it. Uh, fortunately, I think, uh, fortunately uh, he did make it, uh, he got out. Years flash forward to 1991. He and uh, Senator John Kerry, were on a flight. They were on a Boeing 757 flying to uh, Kuwait, where they were going to, as part of a congressional delegation, observe the results of Operation Desert Storm. Now, one was a Democrat, one was Republican, but they were seated across from each other in kind of a tight seating arrangement, almost knee to knee. And they <laughs> didn't particularly like each other. Um, McCain had campaigned against Kerry when Kerry had run for the Senate. They saw the war very differently. One, as I mentioned, was a Naval, a Naval Academy graduate, uh, son and grandson of, of admirals. I think to his death, he believed if we prosecuted the war differently, we would have won. John Kerry had, took very different lessons from the war. And when he came back, he became known as a, a veteran who spoke out uh, very vehemently against the war. And so their experiences were incredibly different but they started a conversation on that overnight flight. It lasted all night, and then it lasted for the next three decades. And so they made friends in the course of that long night, and then they made they, their friendship deepen as they worked together to overcome the legacy of the war, as they worked together to try to bring about some reconciliation uh, between two former enemies. They, they, they realized that what they had to do to get the United States off the path that it was that, then on was to prove a negative. They had to prove that there weren't American soldiers being held in cages in Southeast Asia. And this is the era of you know, Rambo films. Um, you, you may remember that Ronald Reagan was not a big fan of normalization of relations with Vietnam. Neither was Bob Dole, uh, neither were many, many veterans, but they decided they were gonna prove that the Vietnamese were actually quite helpful when it came to fullest possible accounting for those whom we'd lost in the war. And they set up the Senate Select Committee on POW MIA affairs. And then they went out and they worked really hard to, to, to look at all the documents, to find all the evidence, to go everywhere that Leeds took them to see if there was anybody still alive. And what they discovered working with the Vietnamese during this time of really a time of great estrangement was the Vietnamese were absolutely going to be cooperative. They had their own agenda. This wasn't all out of goodness to their hearts, but they, wa they wanted a normal relationship with the United States and they were willing to, uh, to go as far as, as necessary in order to help the, the select committee uh, complete its work. They did. Uh, later on, uh, uh, President Clinton made the decision to normalize relations. But my view is that relationship that started on that night on that plane was really significant. And the, the fact that they worked together uh, against political interests, really, but in, uh, on, the, on behalf of their country, I think they're both deeply patriotic and they were doing what they believed and what I believe was the best for the United States was what, uh, what led us to reconcile, to move a relationship from one of enmity to one of friendship and partnership. 
So when I look at this lesson and, and many of the other lessons of, of, that I learned while I was in Vietnam, the various times that Dean Ayers mentioned uh, early in the relationship and then much later as ambassador, I think it's pretty clear what those senators and what others have taught us. Relationships matter. Diplomacy is much more than transactional. There are some people who think diplomacy is about money and power. I won't name any names, um, but it's not. It's about much more than that. It's about relationships. It's about building trust. And uh, I, the stories uh, throughout this book are designed to show what it is when you take the time to show respect, build trust, and do things together. Do things together that matter because that doing things together, whether it's in health, environment, education, that's what builds that trust. And that's what enables partnership. So that's the first part of my discussion uh, about building trust. The second part is about taking risks. And um, let's be blunt, it's not necessarily in a diplomat's DNA always to take risks. A, a lot of times, uh, you're rewarded not for taking risks, and you're not rewarded if you do take risks. But, but I was, uh, I was in, in Vietnam, this is uh, 2015, I'd been there for a few months, and I began to pick up something that really hadn't been in my notes or in, in my plan uh, for the relationship, especially from uh, someone I had grown to trust, the Vice Foreign Minister Ha Kim Ngoc. He happens to be the uh, Vietnam's ambassador to the United States today, but at that time, uh, he was vice foreign minister. And he told me more than once, he said, the general secretary of the Communist Party, Nguyen Phu Chom, wants to go to the United States. I thought, well, okay, that's an unusual request, but it isn't really my problem because that's Washington to work out. It's the White House that makes uh, invitations to foreign leaders, it's not the ambassador. So very, very interesting. And I kind of took it on and reported back and went on with my business. Um, and I kept hearing this. I heard this from party leaders. I heard it from government leaders. And I began to grasp the significance of this request. Nguyen Phu Chom was a hardliner. He was one of the, the members of the Vietnamese Politburo who was least who seemed least amenable to a strong relationship with the United States. He had risen to power as an expert on Marxism, Leninism, and Ho Chi Minh thought. He didn't really have that much time for capitalists. Um, but he and, uh, he and other members of the Central Committee had been swayed in their views somewhat. And it wasn't by me. This was before, actually it was a few months before I came ambassador, the Chinese, uh, parked an oil rig on, on just off of Vietnam's coast, off the coast of Da Nang, in the exclusive economic zone of the Vietnamese. And it was such a blatant bullying tactic to go and park this right off their coast that the, the Politburo and the Central Committee began to think, you know, our usual means for working out disputes with the Chinese aren't working perfectly. Um, we've got a problem, and we we really might need some uh, some additional friendships in order to deal with this this problem. So the Chinese interpreted this the fact that we were growing a little closer to to Vietnam as evidence of American meddling. I would say is evidence that bullying pushed the Vietnamese into the arms of the United States, and it was our job to open our arms. Um, in March 2015, the Minister of Public Security, Tran Dai Quang, who later became the president of Vietnam, made a trip to the United States. And I made sure he met with Jay Johnson, who was uh, head of Homeland Security at that time, and got other very uh, important senior meetings. He was, he was treated well. And, um, and I briefed him before, and then he came back, and I realized it was again, I was a little slow, but it dawned on me, this is a warm-up act. He's going there to prepare for the general secretary's visit. And another thing suddenly hit me, it was a, kind of a revelation. If I didn't do something about it, it wasn't gonna happen. 
There was nobody in Washington who was going to kind of save me and make this happen and make this visit the Vietnamese wanted so much happen. It was it was up to me. I had to figure it out. Um, and uh, you know, you, when you're assigned overseas, you're supposed to follow your instructions. But I realized, well, I, this in this instance, I need to shape my instructions, and I need to do that really fast. And so I contacted a friend, uh, Tommy Valley, who is chairman of the board of Fulbright University of Vietnam. He's at Harvard. Uh, he, he's the head of the Vietnam program at Harvard. And I said, Tommy, this is really important to the Vietnamese to bring the general secretary of the Communist Party uh, to Washington. And he was very skeptical. He said, no, you know, he's a party. He's a party hack. He's a part. Sorry, I know we're on television, but he's a party leader. He shouldn't be, you know, going to see the president of the United States in the Oval Office. That's not how it works. And I said, Tommy, this is really, really, really important. We have to figure out a way. So finally, I persuaded him, and he went and uh, talked to Secretary Kerry. We kind of went around the system, and uh, he talked to Secretary Kerry and persuaded Secretary Kerry of why this was so significant. Now, there was still an obstacle. Um, the National Security Advisor uh, is not a shrinking violet, Susan Rice. And she made really clear to me, and she made really clear to, to John Kerry, the president receives in the Oval Office heads of state, not party leaders. Get it? Um, but we didn't give up. And uh, John Kerry took advantage of one of his regular lunches with the president to make the case directly to the president. And as, as he put it, I got really beaten up for it, but I got the job done. And to her credit, later when the uh, visit happened, she pulled me aside and said, Ted, you were right. And I think a confident leader can admit uh, when she's made a mistake. In any case, um, the, the trip was now going to happen. And the Chinese noticed. They had enough intelligence to, to, uh, of, of all kinds to figure out that this was really going to happen. This historic visit um, uh, was, was going to take place. And so what did they do? They quickly invited the general secretary to come to Beijing. And he did. A wise man. He knew how to balance competing interests. And uh, the, the Chinese rolled out the red carpet for him. Visit high, very high on protocol. Maybe not so high on substance. Uh, next thing that happened was the Defense Secretary of the United States, Ash Carter, uh, came to Vietnam. And we had what often happens when you have a big visit like that. We had a dinner, and it had dancing, uh, uh, dancing from the Central Highlands. It was beautiful dancing, beautiful music, and there was a lot of red wine. And as the red wine flowed, um, they began to talk a little bit about families, personal things. <laughs> And uh, I think innocently enough, Ash Carter asked uh, Secretary Tang, how did you meet your wife? And he said, oh, well, she picked shrapnel out of my hip. And it didn't take too much imagination to figure out who put the shrapnel there. And the, on we went, drank a little more red wine, some very fine scotch came out and you know, became, it became quite jovial. And Secretary, uh, Sec Defense Minister Tang beamed and said, you know, if we'd had a dinner like this back then, there wouldn't have been a war. At that point, it was really clear on the South China Sea, the issue that mattered the most strategically, we were on the same side as Vietnam. Uh, and so the, vi the visit was on, uh, and the, the party's external relations chief, who reported to the general secretary, uh, published an op-ed in the Washington Post. And he wrote that the visit at the invitation of the President of the United States was a sign of the United States' respect for Vietnam's choice of political regime. This wasn't exactly how the United States had seen it. Uh, Tony Blinken, who was Deputy Secretary of State at the time, wrote a blog post in which he said, well, great significance of this visit is it's an opportunity to include Vietnam in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Well, fine, there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance, but in diplomacy, try to figure out how uh, everybody can get what they're looking for, at least a little bit, a little bit of what they wanted. So on, this, on the morning of uh, July 7th, General Secretary Trump toured the 
the Jefferson Memorial. It was beautiful, beautiful May day. The tidal basin was glimmering. It was uh, it was quite stunning, and I had to think again. Well, you know, why did he choose this as his first stop? Ho Chi Minh had used Thomas Jefferson's words in, when he declared independence from the Japanese in 1941. Uh, he had written all he had said in Baden Square: "All people are created equal. The Creator." has endowed them with inviolable rights. Among these rights are the right to life, the right to liberty, and the right to the pursuit of happiness. Sounds pretty familiar. So I go in and see uh, Dan Crittenbrink, who was then the, the senior director for Asian affairs at the White House, later became my successor as ambassador to Vietnam, and now as assistant secretary of state for East Asia. And he said, Ted, what's the one thing that the president needs to say to the general secretary? And I said, he needs to say the United States rep respects different political systems. He said, that's all he needs to say. If he says that, this will be seen as a, a, uh, an opportunity to build trust. They'll know we're not trying to overthrow them. We had tried that before and we had failed. And, and it, will, it, it will allow this relationship to move forward, unfettered by mistrust. And, um, and on the other side, I'd urge the, the, my friends in the party to, t to tell the general secretary not what to say, but how to, how to speak to the president of the United States. I said, put down the notes, look him in the eye. This is a human being. Forget the notes, talk to him like a, like a human being. And he did, miraculously he did. And this, uh, what was supposed to be a 45 minute set piece meeting went on for an hour and a half. It broke historic ground. The president said those key words that the United States respects different political systems. He also said a lot about what we needed. He talked about TPP. It was very clear on human rights. Uh, he said, this is just who we are. We have our own challenges when it comes to human rights, but this is just who we are. Um, and uh, he, he had been very well prepared for this meeting. Um, I can contrast that later on somebody else, but the, they made an, they made it, th this meeting built trust between two human beings, two, two leaders of countries, and, and broke ground and enabled us to just take off in the relationship uh, for the next, I would say, until today. That was what set us off on a, a new trajectory. Um, they, they made, uh, there were other agreements that they achieved, but the most important line in the joint statement was, the two countries agreed to respect different political systems. And uh, Joe Biden, who was vice president at the time, uh, quoted Nguyen Zhu, the great poet and writer of Vietnam. Troi con de con hom nai, ten sung dao ngo ven mai zu trai. Thank heaven we are here today to see the sun through parting fog and clouds. There's, there's symbolism in this because this is, this is what uh, Bill Clinton had done when he normalized relations and went to Vietnam the first time. He quoted Nguyen Zhu, the great poet, and showed respect uh, by doing that so much so that when, the, uh, when Joe Biden visited later, uh, the, the first lady of Vietnam had made for her a kainon, you know, the conical hat. And it etched those words inside. So when he held it up to the light, you could see those words. Uh, they, they also agreed to establish Fulbright University. They agreed, the general secretary agreed that there would be academic freedom, Fulbright University. This had not happened before. And they joined the TPP. And in so doing, they agreed to have a, a there was a side letter that said, we will have, there will be freedom of association for the workers of Vietnam. Now this is, the capitalists told the communists uh, how they ought to be treating their workers and the Vietnamese swallowed this and went ahead. And it was the most significant human rights agreement we have ever achieved with Vietnam. And it's a direct result uh, of that visit. Um, this, was, this was a huge, step for the Vietnamese in terms of their future prosperity, their independence. Uh, and 
it was a huge step when it came to trade. And even though we pulled out of TPP, they didn't. And they are benefiting uh, from that agreement, but we're not benefiting from the, the side letter on, on human rights because once the US pulled out, uh, or workers' rights, once the US pulled out, uh, that was no longer, um, no longer possible. So I've con I concluded that, and I have to say this was not what I planned, but the most consequential accomplishment of my time as ambassador was getting the General Secretary of the Communist Party into the Oval Office. Other things were wonderful. The three days when, when Barack Obama was in, the, in, in Vietnam, was visiting Vietnam, I, those were the highlights of my 30 years as a diplomat, those three days. It was very, very exciting. But that wouldn't have happened or it wouldn't have been so substantive. The, uh, the move, forward movement on trade, on security, on the environment, on health, on all of the things that have made up the sinews of this relationship, they wouldn't have happened if he hadn't, uh, if he hadn't gone. So uh, my lesson is sometimes it's worthwhile to take a risk. Thank you very much. So we'll go over here. Okay. We yes. overage our chairs. Six feet apart. Six feet apart. Mm -hmm. So we're picking up our rent. Getting wired up. Getting wired up. See when I'm getting a glass of wine from you too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I'm wired up to keep them going. <laughs> well, Ambassador Ozan. May I call you Ted at this point? Is yes, that please. Right? Thank you. Um, I actually first met Ted Osius in Ubud in Bali at the, uh, the Ubud Writers Festival. He was the deputy chief of mission and I was there as a, as a moderator of sessions at the Ubud Writers Festival. And so, uh, he and his husband Clayton had had a, a wonderful dinner for all the Americans who were there. There were a number of us. So for me, it's very exciting to get to be here to talk about this book with you. It seems incredibly fitting since uh, this is sort of how we met in this in this in this context. Um, this is a wonderful book. You all have to buy it, and it's out there. And and Ted is also willing to sign it, which is great. And. Um, and I, you, you are absolutely right. It is a book of stories, but there's also a fascinating amount of history and background. And you know, just listening to you speak, it, it seems like so many times the U.S. just sort of missed the boat with Vietnam. That somehow we didn't really understand what was going on there. You mentioned the relationship with China, and your book is tell us a little bit about the historic relationship with China and um, the people of Vietnam. Well, it goes back a long time, many millennia. And uh, there were 900 years where Vietnam was part of China. And this, <laughs> it, it is in the DNA of every Vietnamese citizen to resist foreign domination. And the number one existential challenge to the Vietnamese has always throughout their history been China, not France, not the United States. Yes, they fought, they fought wars with others and with Cambodia and uh, there, there, there's been plenty of conflict, but to every single village in Vietnam has streets named after Tran Hung Dao and the Hai Bat Chung and Mo Quyen and the great heroes who fought the Chinese. Who always, there are people who fought the, fought the Chinese. Yes, uh, Ho Chi Minh and uh, General Zap are also heroes, but there aren't streets named after them in every, in every village. There are streets named after those who fought the Chinese. And, you know, I had to think, did, did nobody tell President Kennedy or President right. Johnson that, that the dominant theory does just doesn't really apply here? Right. They're not going to follow the, the Chinese. This is not in their history. It's not, it's, a, it's totally counter right. to their DNA. And what I've concluded is that um, one, of the, one of the results of McCarthyism was that the State Department had been wiped clean of people who really knew the region. And so there weren't people around to kind of check the not so good instincts of McNamara and, and others who continued to advise uh, two presidents to dig in deeper. Right. 
Right. Um, so I, I think I think we made an, an, uh, an enormous error that we didn't need to make. Yeah, it comes through so clearly in your book, and I I was actually staggered by that. I thought this is unbelievable that this 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 unintended consequence of getting rid of all the experts on East Asia yes. would would have this effect. And um, and you write a lot about this. There's a lot of wonderful and deep background. I mean, the fact that Ho Chi Minh was quoting Thomas Jefferson. Yes. Like, how did we not, did we not know that? Well, he wrote seven times to Harry Truman saying, yeah. what about independence for, what about self-determination? Now, what about these things that you say you stand for? Seven times. Those letters were not answered. I don't think they ever reached Harry Truman. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just fascinating, the um, just sort of how, I mean, you make it so clear that, that what Vietnam just wanted was independence, independence from, from China, from Japan, from France, from the United States, that that was the goal, and that somehow we completely misread this. Yeah. It was nationalism, uh, it was the desire to be independent, and I don't think it even really mattered that much that they were communists. Yeah. I think in the end, I mean, it's not a particularly communist country now. It's it's uh, <laughs> uh, it's very energetically capitalist. It is a one-party system, right. um, but it's a very energetically capitalist, entrepreneurial uh, one-party system. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's that. Well, I got to actually visit as a State Department speaker while you were there and and uh, talked at the Vietnam News Agency, and it was. I agree with you. I mean, the, the cliche that people say is, well, we lost the war, but we won the peace. Yes. And you have the statistic. I never knew. You, you talk about a survey that said that more than 90% of Vietnamese today consider the U.S. to be Vietnam's closest friend. More than 90%. Yeah. Yes. That's just astonishing. It's phenomenal. It's quite phenomenal. So let me tell just a little sure. story. Um, I, um, Professor Steele mentioned and, and Dean Ayers mentioned that I like to bike and that I biked from uh, north to south in Vietnam. And I stopped on the way in what was once the DMZ on a bridge. And I was looking out over the landscape and there were all these ponds uh, that I saw. And I, there was a woman standing next to me, a little bit older. And, she, and I, I said, well, why, why are there so many ponds? There's, sort of, there's a sort of a strange assortment of ponds here. And she said, well, that's where the Americans dropped their bombs. And then she started to tell me how many member, how many people in her village were killed by the Americans and how many members of our family. And then, you know, it was starting to really hurt. Well, she's being, she's being honest. I've got to be too. I said, well, I'm an American and, and I work for the embassy. I represent the United States. And she said, uh, night, la chi en. Vietnamese language is very familial and intimate. You're always, there's no you, there's how you are related in the family. She was saying, we are older sister, younger brother. Not excellent, you know, not excellency or sir or anything like that. Older sister, younger brother. And that to me embodies the spirit. It's this willingness to, to move forward, to look, to look forward and, and uh, put the past put that past behind them. We had a much harder time doing that than the Vietnamese right. did. Right. And I have to say, when you tell this wonderful story in your book, you tell it in the several times, but in once in the context of your hearing yes. uh, to be confirmed. And, um, and you say that you had to, your mother told you not to say that at the <laughs> hearing because you might tear up. And so you had to practice <laughs> several times. <laughs> I can't even, this is a lot of I know, I know. I never had a repent when I tell that story because it's, to me, it's yeah. so powerful. Yeah. Uh, but this is why he was the people's ambassador. It's just clear. <laughs> I mean, that, that you care so much. Um, yeah. and, and I think that just, that comes through so clearly how much you care, how you, you lobbied for this for the job. You wanted the job. It was the dream. Your dream to it was my dream to have that job. Privilege of, of a lifetime. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really incredible. That um, there's so much. But before we, there are a bunch of things I want to ask you about. But one other thing about the Chinese. Tell us about about this this amazing war strategy that the Vietnamese yes. had to impact. You, you tell us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, the. There's a place called the Bac Dang River. Three great battles were fought 
in the Bakdang River, uh, two in the 10th century and one in the 13th. And they were, they were waged by these generals who later became emperors of Vietnam, whose names are on every, <laughs> every single village, every single city and every single village in Vietnam. And each one of them used to, it was different, they, they had different adversaries, Chinese twice, Mongolians once, that each one of them used the same strategy. They put these wooden stakes, these big wooden stakes tipped with iron into the mud. And they lured Chinese twice, Mongolians once uh, to that area when the tide was high. And then when the tide came down, the, the ships were impaled on these, these spikes. Now you think people would learn, this is what the Vietnamese do. They use the power of their enemy against him. Think about that, yeah. French. They used the power of the French, who were an immensely powerful nation at that time, against French. They used the power of the United States against us. Right. They were weaker, smaller, just as they were against the Chinese and against the Mongolian, but they used the same self impalement strategy again and again and again. And we, you know, they knew, they, Ho Chi Minh said, you may lose one for every 10 that I lose, but I will win and you will lose. You he wrote, wanted. He wrote, when the Chinese fleet moved in to attack, they did so at high tide. When the tide went down and the water receded, the stakes pierced their hulls, sinking every vessel. The strategy of allowing the strong to use its own power for self-impalement is not a single event, but a pattern. Yes. Well, I highlighted that. Allowing the strong to use its own power for self impalement. That's sort of, yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyways, a, well, a story of a lot of wars, isn't it? Um, the, I, I was interested, is, there's so many things. Um, you, you talk about sort of, you talk about two different flags and how these flags had the significance yeah. in your tenure as ambassador. One is that POW MIA flag and this, this sort of idea out there that there still must be Americans. Missing, and you know, I, and you know, the, the whole Rambo thing, the Reagan thing, and that I think there's still probably people who think there must Americans who think there must be POWs, and then the uh, missing, and then the other flag is the yellow flag of South Vietnam, and yes. to tell that story. That's a that's a very interesting. Um, that was an interesting diplomatic moment for you. Well, one of the so, things, yeah, one of the things that um, any U.S. ambassador to Vietnam needs to do is go and talk to Vietnamese Americans uh, because that's there are 2.2 million Americans of Vietnamese origin and that's an incredibly important constituency for the relationship. So I did this many times um, and uh, one time in Orange County uh, I, and I this is this was the country to which I was credited it has a red flag not a yellow flag um, a woman came up and she wanted to put the yellow flag around me and I, uh, around my shoulders, and I asked that she not do that um, because you, I said if you do that, you're going to make it really hard for me to do the things I want to do in Vietnam, promote human rights, move the relationship forward, um, and that became translated as I forbade any display of the yellow flag, which is certainly not what I did. But I, I didn't, I didn't want to be photographed with the yellow flag. And yet I understood the significance of that for a lot of people. And after one of these encounters, I, there were 500 people in this audience, 500, many, many you go up there. And I spoke to them in, in Vietnamese and made fun of my Northern accent and tried to uh, loosen things up just a little bit. And um, Ed Royce, who was chairman at the time said, you did a good job, investor. And then people wanted to come up and talk to me. And a man came up he grabbed my lapels and he said, Ambassador, in, in Vietnamese, Ambassador, I spent 11 years in a re-education camp. And I said, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for your suffering. I'm sorry for what you've lost. And he held on again. He said, Ambassador, I spent 11 years in a re-education camp. I said, I'm so sorry. I, you know, I'm, I'm the U.S. Ambassador to, uh, to Vietnam. I would... Is there any, anything I can can do to, to help? Ambassador, I spent 11 years in a re-education camp. It occurred to me, 
He wanted those years back. Couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. And I, I, could under, I could only sympathize with someone. He was probably in his 70s. He had seen that yellow flag come down. He'd fought for that flag for years and years and years. He had seen it come down and never, it never went back up. Mm -hmm. And he is, reconciliation mm -hmm. is not possible for him. And there are people for whom it's not possible. It's just suffered too, too, too much. Mm -hmm. But I also think, and Kane and Carrie were right, we owe it to both countries to continue to pursue reconciliation, mm -hmm. even though it's hard. Mm -hmm. And then there were others. You talk about one man, I think he was also in Houston, who said, so what can I do? Yes. And, and what did you say? So she, it was a woman, and it was a gathering of very hardline uh, men right. uh, in Houston. That was one of the toughest communities I met. And I sort of explained what we were trying to do, and she said, yes, she said that. How can, how can we help? And I thought it took courage for her to say that in front of that group. How yeah. can we help? And I said, education. I think the one thing you can do, it's not political. If you want young Vietnamese to have a different set of opportunities from what their parents and grandparents had, then education. And that's what led me to fall at University of Vietnam because I, I so believed if you could have, uh, if you could have advanced, especially advanced education that opened up people's minds and allowed them to think critically, well then you make change possible. Where, where will the change lead? I don't know exactly now, but I know you won't have that change if you don't, aren't opening people's minds. And this is also a light motif in your book, I think, the idea that, um, that, that non-political things like education and health, that this yes. is really the way to work toward reconciliation, that you find, as you said earlier in your talk, common ground, that you, yes. you're always looking for common interests. What, can what can we do together? And then you work on those other things. That's what builds trust. Yeah. And I mentioned Hakim Ma, the former vice foreign minister, who said it was so important for from Lin Fu Chong to go to the Oval Office. He also said something that I listened to in the first weeks. He said, if we can move this relationship from bilateral cooperation to regional and global collaboration on issues that matter, we will transform it. And that's what we did. Yeah. You know, that's what we worked together on health, on public health. We worked together on the environment. We worked together on peacekeeping. The Vietnamese who suffered so much then started contributing to global peacekeeping. And we went together on education. And I think that's what allowed us to take off. Well, it's interesting your history with the Vietnamese community in the United States because, well, you ended up resigning the Foreign Service because of the Trump administration's policy on repatriating 8,000 Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese in America. Would you, would you, yes. Can you explain that story a little sure. bit? It's, so lots of things I didn't like. I didn't like the withdrawal from TPP. I felt like we threw away our best leverage. The great negotiator threw away the best leverage we possibly could have uh, in dealing with the Chinese in Asia. And I really didn't like our withdrawal from the Paris Accord on climate change. I had been working hard throughout my career to do what I could on, on climate change. And I hated the Muslim ban. And I was like, one thing after another, I offered to resign, and my offer was rejected, and my team said, Ambassador, you, know, was, you, you thought we needed you before, we really need you now. You gotta try to keep the ship steady for a little while longer. And I thought, well, I will as long as, as I can do it without crossing impossible economic, uh, impossible ethical lines, because I wanna be able to look at my kids and say, Papa did the right thing. So then it came, really, it came home. Uh, during the spring and the summer of 2017, I began to get these instructions to facilitate the deportation of Vietnamese Americans from the United States. And these were sometimes people, they, had, they might have had deportation orders because they'd stolen a car or been involved in a gang when they were teenagers. Um, one was a guy named Tuan who had come over he was a boat person, come over on a boat, and, and he had gotten involved in a gang, and, uh, and he had made some mistakes, but he'd done his time, and he had built this supermarket with, with uh, 50 employees. He was paying a couple million dollars in taxes each year. He had a very successful business, three kids, 
and it, you know, it moved on from the days of, of carjacking. And uh, not only did they put him in, in prison again, uh, but they uh, they went ahead and deported him to a country that he didn't know anything about. I mean, he he, he may, maybe spoke a little bit of Vietnamese, but he'd been loyal to a yellow flag, and there was a, this other flag right. in Vietnam, and they went ahead and deported him. And they deported, uh, and this was this was in, in motion when I was still ambassador. They were going to deport Amerasians, children of our soldiers. There, were, there was this massive push by Stephen Miller to deport yellow people. That's what it was about. If there were no regions, it wouldn't have happened. It was race. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was racism at its ugliest. And I just thought there can be nothing more un-American than this, and I will not do this. And so I tried everything I could inside to slow it down. I stuck sticks in the spokes of that the bicycle. State. He acknowledged it. Yeah, he was in a deep state at that point. Um, I stayed that. I kept telling him, listen, if you, the president's coming in November, if you do this, you're going to totally mess up his trip. He's going to look bad. The president is going to look bad. And they told me, the Vietnamese told me at one point, because we were threatening to withdraw port courtesies from Vietnamese officials. And I delivered that message, and the Vietnamese officials said, well, fine, then we won't go. You disrespect us, we are going. And then the visit would have been a disaster. The President of the United States would have come, and it would have been a disaster. So I used that. I wrote to Rex Tillerson multiple times. I wrote to McMaster. I wrote to Jim Mattis. I kept pu pushing back and saying, this is going to harm this relationship. Don't, you, you can't do it. I didn't get an answer until after uh, I resigned. The answer was from Rex Tillerson. He said, we're going to go ahead and do this. But I just, I couldn't. I, I, I thought it was so wrong and so un-American. I couldn't support it. And in the end, the job of a diplomat is you, you carry out the instructions produced by a democratic system until the day comes when you can't. And then you got to go. And so I went, and I didn't write about it until after I, I left office. But after I left office, I did write about it because I thought, people don't even know this is happening. This is Stephen Miller operating in the dark, whispering in the president's ear, and people don't know. And I got the word out, and there was a, a fair amount of media, and four members of Congress uh, California, in, in California, Republicans lost their jobs in, in uh, districts that were heavily Vietnamese American. So I don't think people did like what the administration was doing. In, in secret, but it took bringing it out into the open. Right, and there, um, there's, in Ted's book, there's a wonderful description of your visit to the, I, I gather your one and only visit to the Oval Office in the Trump White House. Yes. <laughs> and it is, uh, it's a humdinger. So I won't yeah. spoil that one, but I would say it's worth buying Ted's book just to read that. <laughs> and to hear some of the things that the President of the United States yeah. said in your, in, in, uh, unbelievable, or perhaps yes. not unbelievable, but that's, uh, that I, I don't want a spoiler alert. I'm not going, I won't spoil it. So you have to buy the book. So what did happen? I mean, how many of, I, I tried to figure this out, I Googled this yesterday and I didn't get very far. How many Vietnamese were deported ultimately? Do you have any idea? I have not been able to get that answer. Uh, I have continued to ask. I believe that it slowed down to a trickle. That's um, what it looked like. That I don't think it has ever stopped 100%. Yeah. Because the, <laughs> there's the other problem of the deep state. Once, you're, once you've turned that ship in a particular direction, it's hard to turn, turn it back. back. Right. Um, but I think it slowed down to a very, very tiny number. That's what it looked like. I, the yeah. last date I saw was 2018, and it, there, were, there were still numbers in the teens, sort of. Like. Yes. And I submitted a bunch of uh, statements uh, right. on behalf of people. Right. And some of the, uh, we managed legal, especially uh, lawyers working pro bono, yeah. um, were able to stop some of the deportations. It's interesting because you don't make the connection in your book, but I'm fascinated by all the times that you spoke with the Vietnamese community in the United States you know, who didn't approve of the, 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 the new government of Vietnam, and then what you actually did to support them. I mean, I, you just love Vietnam and mm -hmm. Vietnamese people. Well, the other, the final thing I want to ask, and I know that we have a bunch of questions out there, is I am fascinated by your, your activism on this topic and also on gay and lesbian rights. And you founded GLIFA, I didn't know that's how we pronounced it, I wasn't sure, back when 
Well, you could you certainly couldn't be appointed an, an ambassador if yeah. you were gay. You would lose your security clearance. clearance. Yeah, yeah. And that's recently, as recently as what the eight eighties, right? Or yeah, as recently as the eighties. No, actually, until the second term of of Bill Clinton. Right. So mid nineties. Right. Um, yeah. So we found a good I yeah, I met my husband in Griffith, yeah. so the good things came out of that organization. But also, we changed, uh, we managed to change yeah. policy the in the State Department. So yeah. I have friends who are in the audience who will remember that um, I never hid who I was, and I certainly didn't really, I didn't really want them to find out. We, we, the membership list of our organization, we'll we kept secret because yeah. we knew that if diplomatic security found it, we'd all lose our security clearances and lose the ability to, to operate. And we had a very simple goal. We, we wanted non-discrimination based on mm -hmm. sexual orientation. Yeah. And that did finally happen at the end of Bill Clinton's first term yeah. in office. Uh, so that's not that long ago, if you think no. about it. But at that time, no, you couldn't possibly imagine an out gay person becoming an ambassador. Yeah, yeah. Flash forward, I had, uh, uh, you know, I had uh, some delays in my confirmation that nothing that had to do with my sexual orientation. It's just not an issue. I spoke Vietnamese, I was yeah. qualified and, uh, and I went through. And a, a few months after we'd been there for a few months and uh, the Supreme Court made the decision, of, the Obergefell decision that made um, we been married in Canada, but made made our marriage uh, legal mm -hmm. in all 50 states. And at that moment, I got a, a, a letter from Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who said, I want to come to Vietnam. Can I stay with you? <laughs> I said, you bet. <laughs> yes, please come stay with us. Um, and she did. And a friend of mine said, well, why don't you ask her to renew your vows? Mm -hmm. And we'd been married for 10 years at that point. And I thought, well, that's a chutzpah. But uh, I asked her, and she said, sure, I'll, I'll do that. So she renewed our vows in the living room of the residence. And we had our children by then. They were, they were still little. They were, they were one and two. Um, and it meant so much. We had thought about it as kind of a political yeah. gesture. So young people in Vietnam, you can have a family and a job, and you can be gay, you can be yourself. And uh, it turned out it was really good for us right. because... Yeah, we had these children, and we knew what marriage meant sure. at that point. We, by then, we really understood what, what marriage meant, and uh, our children were kind of living proof. We knew the responsibilities of, yeah. uh, of it, and there, so it was very powerful, powerful yeah. for us. Can you tell a, a, a wonderful, there's a whole set of uh, stories about being in ambassadorial charm school, yes. um, which I didn't know existed, but that's worth reading about too. Um, and the director of FSI asked you, do you want to be known as the gay ambassador or would you rather be considered the best ambassador? And how did you, how did you answer that? What, how did, yeah. Well, and I had to think about it pretty quickly because the first, a few months later, I was going to land and, you know, this very conservative yeah. society. So I thought, well, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I'm going to be me because that's all I know how to do. And so we, I did a video where uh, I did entirely in Vietnamese where I introduced myself and my family to the people of Vietnam. And it kind of went viral. One, because I spoke Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And two, because our son was really, really cute. Um, and so that video went all over the place. And then when we arrived, the first picture that the Vietnamese people saw was um, me with my African-American husband and my, uh, my eight, then 85-year-old mother and our toddler child. And I think that helped because we were a three-generational family. And that was something the Vietnamese could relate to. Mozadim uh, a three-generational family, because that's what you want to have in a in a home. And so people related to that. And the fact that we were gay, I don't think ended up making much of a difference. But they were, we were just, we were welcome. We were really welcome, even in that very conservative society. Oh, it made a huge difference to a number of young gay and lesbian Vietnamese. It did. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. 
I've dominated, um, I got moderator's privilege here, and I know we have questions from the floor, and we also have some questions from the Zoom audience. If um, first priority goes to those of you who came here, um, if you have a question, would you step up to the microphone, please? We need to record this for posterity. And uh, please say your name and uh, who you are, just so we, where are you from? Uh, hello, uh, Ambassador. So thank you very much for what you have done to our countries. And then my name is uh, Big Chan uh, from the University of Antwerp. And I'm also uh, an adjunct fellow of the CSIS, Southeast Asia Program. Uh, so, uh, you know, in your book, you wrote that uh, the, you know, the, um, the content of the U.S.-Vietnam partnership already strategic. It's not just uh, in the name yet. And then, uh, you know, the Vietnamese ambassador to the United States, Ha Kim Ngoc, also said that several times already. Uh, but, you know, still in, uh, in the, you know, uh, within the relationship uh, between the United States and Vietnam, then a strategic partnership is still a higher level than a comprehensive strategic partnership. So my question is that in your view, you know, in the future, when the two countries, you know, actually upgrade their relationship to a strategic partnership, then how will it look like, especially in defense uh, uh, cooperation and intelligence uh, sharing? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. So my view is that the Vietnamese have been quite practical. And it's kind of like Moon Fuchong going to Beijing before he went to the Oval Office. Um, they know they have to balance relations with us, with relations with the 800-pound gorilla, the, the nation of 1.2 billion on their northern border, but with which they've had so many wars, uh, including a recent one in the 19, you know, 1979 to 1991. People forget thousands of people died every year during that border war. So they know how much pain China can inflict on them. And the change in name of that partnership would cause all kinds of pain and it wouldn't get them anything um, because we already have a strategic partnership. How can help is absolutely right. It's already strategic. We are doing, they're doing more on, in the military realm with us than with any other nation by a long shot. They were the uh, number one export market, uh, where the numbers are, are all going up in terms of uh, our engagement with Vietnam. So the strategic partnership already exists, it just doesn't have that name because it would cause so much trouble uh, to their north. So I think that the relationship going forward has no real ceiling. There's no limit to what is possible in this relationship, but it has, to, it has a pace. And it can't surge too fast because it will cause Vietnam a lot of problems. And uh, you know they 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 want they're going to limit they're going to keep it going at a kind of moderate pace. So, for example, aircraft carriers every other year. Now that was unthinkable when it first happened. A visit to Da Nang by a U.S. aircraft carrier, five thousand sailors coming aboard. That hasn't happened since the war, but we made that happen. And there will be more every other year, but they won't do it too fast because it would cause huge problems. So my view is it'll keep going and just at a, um, a moderate pace. Thank you. Oh, uh, my name is Jim Bullock. I'm a retired PD officer. And, and uh, around about the same time I joined the service, I married a French woman. And uh, she had an uncle who actually had been a captive at the NBN food. Mm. And so going back to Paris a lot over all the years, lots of Vietnamese in France now. I'm just curious if you, I mean, maybe you didn't treat that, maybe that's all you know, before the Vietnam War did it. But I'm just kind of curious about comparing and contrast. We try to spend as PD officers, we try to get libraries open and, and English teaching. Well, the French had French libraries at, and the military back when I was in the, you know, the military, they were teaching us to learn French to go to Vietnam, not Vietnamese, it was a lot easier for one thing. But just maybe any, any observation about well, what did we do right that the French did? The French lost to war. The French had tremendous soft power investment uh, they had all kinds of opportunities they could have built on, but they didn't. This may be some observations. Well, I, I write about Dien Bien Phu in the book because I feel like it's such a, a pivotal moment that I do a kind of a flashback to, under, to explain a little bit what kind of Vietnamese thinking there is because I think that helps us to understand what, what followed. Um, the, the 
the language of French has pretty much disappeared from Vietnam. And that was so, that was so critical to the French that exporting the language. There's still people eat banh mi uh, with pain. The ban is the word for bread. And they, you know, there, there's still vestiges, but only, uh, only very elderly people uh, tend to speak French. Every young person wants to speak English. I mean, you find that everywhere. Um, I think what, one of the things we did is, um, you know, we're, we're the center of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is valued in Vietnam very much, and it is, it, uh, it, it's a, one of our exports. So I think the fact that we kind of stand for entrepreneurship and dynamism and energy um, has, has, what has helped us the most. And then I think the internet, there's been much more interest in young people, among young people in Vietnam, in learning about the United States and other parts of the world, but first of all, the United States, uh, through the internet. And the Vietnamese made a, Vietnamese leadership made a decision early on, well, let's not do what the Chinese did, and we're not going to put a, up a great firewall. So the internet has flourished. Businesses have flourished on the internet. Facebook, there's 70 million people on Facebook in, in a country of 100 million. And so I feel like our culture uh, has been exported through multiple means. Now, we do also have done a lot in the field of education, which I'm really proud of. So our MOOCs, we would do these massive online courses through the American centers in, in Hanoi and in Saigon, which were always crazily oversubscribed. Entrepreneurship was one of the top subjects that, that people wanted to learn. So I think we've done a lot of things right in, in, uh, public in the world of public diplomacy. I'd like to see us keep moving forward uh, in, in terms of technology. And I'll just one quick digression, but in Indonesia, we created something called Ad America, which is this very dynamic hip space where we use a lot of technology to bring people together virtually. And that has flourished in Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim majority nation. We could do something like that. It doesn't cost that much. We could do that in other countries. And I think it would be very, very impactful. So we need to keep updating our tools. So we just did well, the French did. Yeah, well, um, I think they're, uh, <laughs> I think uh, they also, their time as colonial power, they weren't all that interested. They talked about Mission Civilatrice, but they weren't really all that interested in, in uh, raising up people of Vietnam, uh, creating opportunities for the people of Vietnam. They were much more interested in what they could, what they could take back. Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, I'm Bin Nguyen. I'm the fourth year PhD student uh, in economics at uh, George Mason. And I also, I also received a uh, Master of Public Policy from uh, Vietnam from the school. And I just have a simple question for you. Does, uh, what makes you feel the most beautiful when you left Vietnam? The most what? Beautiful. Beautiful? Beautiful. 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 Yeah. Beautiful. Pitiful. Well, I think there were things we didn't do fast enough. So the things that maybe things I like things I regret. Um, because I don't think I don't think anything in Vietnam is pitiful. I think Vietnam is quite magnificent. Uh, uh, I love it, but I do have some regrets. We were too slow to clean up Agent Orange. That's probably my biggest regret. I did all I could as ambassador to keep moving things forward. But um, there are people, there were people until quite recently, families living in, in places where the water was soaked with dioxin, still eating fish out of, out of rivers where dioxin had entered into the flesh of those fish. You that, actually got a question about that on the, uh, and hold really? on. Okay. Yeah, uh, from Charles Bailey, who writes, yes. reconciliation is about people, and the Vietnamese are still deeply concerned about their victims of Agent Orange. The U.S. does provide health and disability assistance to disabled Vietnamese in areas that were heavily sprayed with Agent Orange, but it's described as regardless of cause. Is there any way to reconcile this disconnect between Vietnamese feelings about the heavy impact of Agent Orange and the U.S. helpful but hesitant approach? What do the Vietnamese think about the way ahead? So Charles is my hero. He, he took 
Talk about taking risks. He took huge risks in order to expose the truth about Agent Orange. He invested in sound science to show where the hotspots were. And, uh, and because of Charles's work and because of the work of the, of the Ford Foundation and later went to the Aspen Institute, the United States had, had, had to kind of finally fess up and deal with the consequences of Agent Orange, not only not among our veterans, mm -hmm. but uh, in Vietnam as well. We haven't finished, and he's told the premise of the question is absolutely right. We haven't finished. What I was uh, telling this gentleman about is that there was a place, there, was a, there were places off of Bien Hoa uh, Airfield, which was the third and largest of the hotspots that Charles researched, where people until recently were still living and eating and kids were playing in, in, uh, and being exposed to dioxin. And dioxin, once it gets in your system, it's not only there forever for you, but for your children, your grandchildren, and we now think to the fourth generation. So those kids that I saw where we hadn't cleaned up yet, they were condemned and their families were condemned. So it hurt, you know, because we were so, so slow uh, because of uh, bureaucratics more than anything else. Um, we didn't have enough money to do it all using USAID funds. We needed money from DOB to clean up the mess that the military had created. And it took a long time, and it took people like Charles, it took Patrick Leahy, uh, Tim Reeser, it took other people who were just determined that we do the right thing, who just didn't let go. And uh, Charles didn't, never, never has let go. Uh, and what he has been arguing is that, okay, so now we're finally in the stages where we're finishing the cleanup, so there don't have to be more victims. But what about all those people who are, whose lives are already greatly curtailed by their exposure to Agent Orange? Don't we have a responsibility there? And we do. The bottom line is we do. And we have focused our assistance in uh, places that were most heavily sprayed. But uh, we have also limited. Now, the, I think there's another part of the question where I say, what do you need to do to kind of reconcile the two views? And I think sound science is best. It was sound science that led us to, to clean up the dioxin that still existed in the three hotspots. And I think sound research and science will show that actually not all the birth defects in Vietnam are a result of Agent, Agent Orange. There, there's a high incidence of birth defects in Vietnam, and some of the birth defects are as a result of Agent Orange, but not all. Yeah. And there's been a tendency to lump, you know, say everybody who has a birth defect got it because of the mm -hmm. Americans. Well, that's not accurate. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's better to make decisions based on science. When people said, if you don't, you, there's, there's unexploded ordinance littering the entire country. There's no way you can go in Vietnam where there isn't unexploded ordinance. Well, that's not true. There are places where it's concentrated and where you have to work very hard to make, to make sure that it is cleaned up and that's in train. And there isn't Agent Orange everywhere. Mm -hmm. there, there's Agent Orange in these three hotspots. If you were to ignore science and say, it's soaking the fields and the produce everywhere, why would Vietnam ever turn around? Mm -hmm. And if you focus on where it actually is, and where people have actually been affected, then you can do something about it. So I, I, I like science-based decision-making. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, my name is Fiora Latif. I'm a uh, research fellow at uh, the Center for uh, Public Affairs at George Mason University. And uh, well, thank you for your wonderful discussion and wonderful storytelling. Um, I have many questions, but I've uh, boiled them down to two. Um, first, I'm wondering about building trust. You talk about building trust with Vietnamese, and uh, trust is a two-way process. So uh, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about what did you experience and what did the Vietnamese do to earn your trust? Um, and my second question is a little different, and uh, it's about um, whether you have any um, 
lessons for U.S.-China relationship from your experience with Vietnamese relationship? Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm going to answer your first question in a slightly different way. Not about what they did to earn my trust, but what Vietnamese did to earn the trust of Nguyen Nhi Gop Viet, of Vietnamese Americans, because I think that's really important. There's still a lot of mistrust between that community and the nation, of, especially the leadership of Vietnam. So there's a cemetery uh, out near this, this base, uh, the Bien Hoa, uh, former Bien Hoa Air Base. It's called Bien Hoa Cemetery. And a lot of people who fought for the South are buried in that cemetery. And when I arrived, uh, it was a mess. There were uh, tree roots growing through the graves. And um, sometimes when it rained really heavily, the graves would wash away. Um, they weren't being honored. And in Vietnamese tradition, it's really important to honor the dead and be able to go back to where they've been buried and pay respects. And so I uh, went to leadership in Hanoi and said, what about letting this American NGO clean up this cemetery? It will build a lot of trust. It will allow Vietnamese who suffer great, Vietnamese Americans who suffer great losses to feel more trust. If you do that, it isn't just about money. It isn't just about welcoming, welcoming American investment. It's also about building trust. And the first answer I got was, ah, it's really, really, really difficult. So, but I'm, I'm pretty stubborn and I went back and I went to the chairman of uh, Binzong province where it's located. And I said, listen, you know, we're investing in your province. We're doing everything I could. The real reason I came to see you, Mr. Chairman, is that cemetery. What about just letting them chop some, cut some tree roots and dig some ditches? That's all it is, not flags, not symbols, not this, you know, the people who lost and the people who won, just ditches and tree roots. He said, let me see what I can do. And so he didn't say no. And he obviously consulted with Hanoi because this was, this was sensitive. This is the losing side. Think about our civil war. Now, look how long, <laughs> we're still not over it. And, and it, it took us a very, very long time before we were able to uh, honor those who were lost on the losing side. Well, Hanoi isn't so different, but they let it happen. I got a, uh, a friend told me a, a few months after I left, they've dug the ditches and they've cut down the trees and they've trimmed the tree roots and those people are honored. That's another wonderful that's trust. light motif in the book. I'm so sorry, we are and actually China. out of time. Yeah. So okay. in China, that's a huge answer. <laughs> Good question, huge answer. I apologize to the people online. I've sort of been ignoring you, but them. Um, and, and perhaps you can ask your question once we're done, but we do need to end. Um, it Thank has you. been such a pleasure, and this book is really wonderful, and it's for sale out there, and Ted is willing to stay around and sign it. And yes. So um, let's all thank Ambassador Osius for this really thank wonderful you. Thanks for all of you. Thank you. Thanks for those online.